Um, another way you could have approached this is you could have, um, you know, and, and this would have been easier actually. You never know. Sometimes it's easier to start from the column that's as many emotions as they give you and want march this way. Or you could start from this direction, go this way, and just start looking for it. Does it lie in here? Well, obviously not. There's nothing. Does it lie in here? Well, there's just one. We need all four in there. So it doesn't, and then you can go to there and you'll find it quicker if you go that way. So there, there's two different logics you can go to, to, you know, and if this way is not working for you, you can try going this way. But it's like pull out your fact chart, and, and for this you have to be pretty familiar with all 26 types and know what of the, you know, and, and be very familiar with the 12 subspaces and how they all fit together. Um, you know, and, and understand that, uh, and hopefully you understand it a lot better now. And by the way, if you don't, my master's and PhD thesis have extensive, exhaustive descriptions of all of these shapes. Um, not only the 12 subspaces and their mathematical equations and everything, but, um, but how they all fit together in the, the 26 here. So if you really want to get to know them, you can read that, um, right? But, but, but uh, so you need to be fairly familiar with it and you, you attack it from different sides of the fact chart to find the column that it's in with the fewest number of things. And, and visualizing if it's inside, that's the trick that you need to be good at fact with, okay? So that's, you know, the math approach will take you forever. The rule of congruent pattern approach is faster, only works if you don't have screws uh, that they want. Um, this works if you have screws or anything, um, and it's much faster, and it just requires you having a fact chart, or having the fact chart memorized, which would be really impressive. Because um, I, I, I don't think I get to go through this without looking at it. Um, Okay, but there's a fourth approach, and it's the best approach, okay? And this is, this is how I have fallen into how I find it intuitively in my head. Um, uh, okay, so this is the first one. It's great. Okay, so the fourth is you memorize useful combinations of just two common combinations and use those to fill out the space. So, so let me show you this. So... This is the chart to memorize. And you probably already have most of these memorized. This is very easy to memorize, first of all. By the time I explain it to you, you'll probably already have it memorized and you realize you've memorized 90% of it already. But once you think of this chart that I'm giving you, um, you can fill out spaces um, until, until you find the right space in your head. So, so, so here's, here's, okay, so, so here's, here's the different combinations. Let, let's step through one through three. So one through three is every way you can combine just two red lines, two red rotations. Okay, so the red rotations can be parallel. Anytime you have two parallel rotations, no matter what the distance is, as long as they're not on top of each other, um, then you get a freedom space of parallel red lines and a perpendicular translation arrow. That, if you have not memorized, you absolutely have to memorize. That's one of the most useful things in navigating fact. Two parallel red rotations make a plane of parallel red lines and a perpendicular translation. We've done many examples with that freedom space. It's one of the most popular freedom spaces, and this knowledge is very important, okay? So memorize that if you don't have it already, okay? Okay, so, so you can take two red lines and make them parallel. You can take two red lines and make them intersect. Okay, and that, of course, hopefully you know two intersecting red lines make a disc by now. Okay, you can make, okay, and you can make two skew, you can take the two red lines and make them skew, and that will make a circular, or a, a cyclo, or <laughs> cylindroid. Okay, and again, these don't have to be the extreme generators. Um, but, but it will be the freedom space with two red lines in it. And so the two principal generators will have pitches that have opposite signs. Okay, um, Okay, so, so hopefully you have those memories. Those are all the ways you can combine two red lines, which are the most common lines to combine, okay? Okay, well, another common thing are translations. What are all the ways you can combine two translations? Well, say you have two translations on top of each other. What's the same translation? Well, what if you have two translations that are parallel? Well, that's nonsense. Translations don't have a location, uh, and so they can't really be parallel. They just have direction, so if they're parallel, that means they're just one in the same translation. They mean the same thing. It's just a one degree of freedom. So that's no combination. Okay, what about translations that intersect? Okay, well, again, they don't have location, but they do have direction. So they could make a disk 
If they, if they point in different directions, they make a disk of translations. And then what if they're skew? Again, that's nonsense because they don't have a location. They're just pointing two different directions, so they make a disk. So the only combination you can get from combining two translations of any kind is a disk. So th these three represent all the ways you can combine two red lines. This top one represents all the ways you can combine two uh, translations. Okay? Now let's think of all the ways you can combine a translation and a rotation. Okay? So say you have a translation and a rotation on top of each other. Okay? Well, you can get that, and they will produce um, a freedom space. These are two degrees of freedom, uh, and they will linearly combine to make both the rotation translation, but every screw with every pitch, which remember was, was this guy essentially. This was, this was the constraint example where you know, you got the 6 minus 4 equals 2. You have the, the, the 2 degrees of freedom, the rotation translation, and every screw, you know, you can, you can translate it and rotate it with any pitch you want because there are two independent degrees of freedom. You can rotate and translate any way you want. Okay? So, so that's, you know, if you haven't memorized that, now you, now you have. Okay? So, that's, so that, that's if you have a translation and rotation that are on top of each other. Now what if you have a translation and rotation that are parallel? Well, remember the translation doesn't have a location, so it just has direction, so there's, it's the same thing. So translation that's parallel to this is that. Okay. What about a translation that intersects the rotation? Or in other words, points in a different direction from it. Well, it, that depends on what angle it is. And this is weird because it usually doesn't depend on angle. If it's 90 degrees, then we know it makes this guy. See, it's the same thing. Okay, remember, if you add these two, you can make everything on this plane. Um, and I, I remember I lifted the board and drew that on here um, in, in uh, yeah, lecture five, I guess. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you can see how you could linearly combine these. But, but that only occurs if these are 90 degrees. They always have to be perpendicular. If you have a translation rotation that are pointing in perpendicular directions, whether it's you think of it as intersecting or skew perpendicular, which doesn't make sense because translations don't have location, right? Then you're going to get this, okay? Um, now, and this is this is just as important to memorize as one. I, I would say one and six are the most important to memorize. Well, uh, two you should already have memorized, um, and four is already obvious. Two and four are super obvious, but one and six end up being the most helpful in finding freedom spaces almost every time, okay? So please memorize that if you have a translation perpendicular rotation, you get that. If you have two parallel rotations, you get that. And same thing. Okay? And they're easy to memorize because it's the same freedom space. Okay, but what if your translation is not 90 degrees to the rotation, either skew or on top, which remember again, translations don't have location. Okay? Um, but if it's pointing non 90 degrees, then what happens is you get a new freedom space I've never told you about, okay, um, that it does have two degrees of freedom. It, it, of course, maintains the rotation and the translation at, at a weird non-zero or non-90 degree angle, because if it was zero, it would be this. If it was 90 degree, it would be that. Um, but what it does is it blows out into a plane of screws where um, they're, they're positive. You know, they're, they're, uh, here you can see light green is, is close to zero pitch, and it gets larger and larger and larger, darker and darker green until when it reaches infinity, it, um, it is infinite pitch and, and um, or gets large pitch. And then, and then here, these are all the negative pitches. This is close to zero and gets larger and larger in the negative direction. So negative one, negative two, negative three, that, that kind of thing. Okay? So, so it blows out into a plane with a bunch of screws of all different pitches along it with a single rotation and a translation. So th this one's weird. Okay? Um, and not terribly important to remember, but... Um, but one, two, four, five, and six are critical. And then these are just nice to know. And once you know them all, you know every way you could possibly combine rotations, translations, and rotations and translations. Okay? Um, you could do a similar chart for screws. Every way you can combine a screw with a translation, a screw with a rotation, um, and screw with a screw of different pitches. But those aren't terribly useful, and they're really complex, and they'll slow you down. Okay? So, this is the one that you want ingrained in your mind. If you have this, let me show you how to use those seven principles here. Okay? Okay, so, so what you can do, well, let's see here. 
Uh, yeah, before I give you this example, um, yeah, okay, okay, so for instance, uh, let, me, let me explain how you use this first of all. So say, say I give you a freedom space where I have three intersecting rotations of, of, of weird angles, okay? Or maybe they're 90 degrees, okay, like on X, Y, and Z rotations. Um, you're probably smart enough to know that's a sphere of rotations, but, but what you could do is say, okay, say you don't know that, how would you use this chart? You, you would pick any random two, so maybe the one on the X and the Y rotation, and you'd say, okay, I know those intersect, those make a, a disk. So you'd fill in the disk. Now you have a disk and a, and a red line popping up in the z-axis. Okay? So you've added those, you've filled in those new lines in the freedom space. Then you take, you could take, you know, any other ones. You'd probably want to take the z and one of the things from the disk, add those together, and that would make another disk. So now you have two disks that are kind of interlocking. You could grab any other two in there and add those, and those would make a disk. And pretty soon you start seeing you fill out the freedom space, and if you're familiar with the fact chart, you can go right to the fact chart and see, oh, this is the one that's being filled out. Okay? So that, that's what you do. You have different combination of motions. You pick any random two, fill it in with this knowledge, add more, and then pick any other two, fill in with this knowledge, add more. And of course, the two you pick are always rotations or translations, because that's what this is a combination of, and that's the skeleton of a freedom space. And, um, and of course, you know, these two or these three might help you generate some screws as well, so you can kind of get a sense for the screws that you're filling in. Um, but you just fill out the freedom space and you can do that. And when you do this, if you learn these principles, for any combination of motions I give you, you can very quickly combine a bunch of pairs and fill out the freedom space. And you'll find your brain fills it up very rapidly and you can go right to it on the fact chart. Okay, so let's, let's do an example. And, and use some of these approaches, okay? Okay, so, um, all right, so, so, so say, I, say I gave you this. Say I, I, you know, this would be a little more complicated one that's not obvious. So you have X, Y, and Z. So say I want a rotation in X, a rotation in Y, a rotation that's parallel to X but intersects this thing out here on Y um, that's a rotation and a rotation that's also parallel to x that's up intersects the z-axis, and then a translation that points in the, it, it's in the plane of the yz direction, or, uh, well, let, let's say this, it's in the direction of, like, uh, negative 1 y and positive 1 z, so it's 45 degrees from the y-axis. So, so if it was a vector, it would be 0, negative 1, 1. And that's not a unit vector, but that, that points in the right direction. Okay, so that's the translation. Okay, whether that's clear I drew it that way or not. Okay, so I've given you five motions, whether they're all, you know, whether it's a five degree of freedom system or not, like, you know, who knows? Uh, it might just have, you know, uh, I mean, it, it might have, who knows how many are dependent, right? But I just gave you the, you know, say, say a consultant comes to you and says, I want to design a flexure system that moves with this combination of motions. Okay. Well, if you're a glutton for punishment, you could write all these twists and add them all together and interpret the space that comes out. And before you do that, if you want to stack in a matrix, do Gaussian elimination, you know how many are independent, okay? And you can confirm, is that in the right column, et cetera, of the fact chart. So great. So that would be the math way. Um, the other way you could do it is you could, um, the second approach is, you know, don't draw this as, a, as an arrow, draw it as a hoop, and then find all the blue lines, intersect all the red lines, and you could just look at your fact chart and see which one that is. Or you could just find all the red lines intersect with the blue lines and fill it out yourself. Okay, um, so the, the second approach would work because there's no screws in here. Um, and then the third approach. Let's do the third approach actually. So get this, fuse this in your mind, and and see if you're good enough to look at the fact chart and find these in there. Okay, so remember there's five. So we'll look at the fact chart, and we'll start in the fifth column, and we'll look at this and say, are those in there? Okay, well, let, let's look back. So, remember, this is the intersecting red planes with the, the black uh, translations that are perpendicular to this axis. Well, I can tell you it is in there, okay? And I can tell you uh, this would be the axis, okay? So, if this is the axis of the planes, first of all, that's on the planes. All these would be on intersecting planes that intersect that line, and this would be an arrow that's perpendicular to it. So, hopefully you can see that, yes, indeed, that would lie within here, so it's like, well, great, that lies in there. And you might be tempted to say, 
and it's the only one in there, and so it's the right one. I'm good. This is the correct one. Well, you'd be wrong um, because there's a little trick to what I taught you, which is since there's only one type in here, you know, I, I, you know, you have to have at least two or more types to identify if, if it's the only one in that column, right? If there's only one type and you found it's in there, there's no guarantee it's the right one, right? So if it's, if it's in the phi df column, there's a little exception because if, if you find that it lies within there, doesn't necessarily mean it's the correct one. You, you do need to go over and check and make sure that none of these contain it. So if you jump right to here, you find it does lie within it, um, then, uh, oh, by the way, if you check it in, in this chart and it doesn't lie within even this, then uh, you can't achieve it with a parallel system. Okay? So that, that's just one thing. But, but, so, but I don't want to confuse that. That's for kind of a future lecture. But, but you know, for, if it's parallel system, it will definitely lie in here if it has five, if they gave you five things, right? And, and it did. Um, but, but you'd have to check here and make sure it's not in any of these, and then you would know this is the correct one. You couldn't just say, because it lies in it, and it's the only one in its column, we're good, because it's the only one in its column, and you can't compare it. So, so okay, all right, so it lies in there, but let's, let's check this one. Does it lie, um, does it, and that's just what this is saying. Does it lie in this one? Uh, no. Okay, does it lie in this one? Uh, yeah, so no, if you can't see this, there's a, a, a red filled in plane, and then there's a box of parallel lines and, and a disk of translation. So if you go back to here, you could imagine this, this, and this, you know, the, pl the red plane could be X and Y, and then the box could be everything pointing parallel to this guy, and then here's the, in the disk of translation. So like that, it's in there. So yeah, it's, it's in there. Is it in there? Uh, no, it's not, okay? So, okay, so, so, First of all, since you found it in any of these, you know it's not the correct one here. Okay, that, that's the first, first thing to tell yourself. Since, since if you found it in any other one, that means abandon this one. Okay? Um, and check it out. Since this has more than one in it, okay, uh, meaning types, but we only found one that it lies within, these motions, you know this is correct. Okay, you don't need to keep marching over because now it follows the standard rule that if the motions you want lie within only one freedom space in the column, and the column has more than one freedom space, uh, you know you've got the right one. Okay, so it's like, so that's the right one. Okay, so we use that approach. But a, a much smarter approach would be um, to use that final approach here. So, so by the way, yeah, this one, this one may, it lies in that one. We, we just found that. And by the way, it has a bunch of screws, and it's, it's constraint spaces, the plane of parallel lines and stuff. So, the blue lines would go this way on the xy plane. All right. Okay. So, so, but anyway, let's use that new approach. Okay. So, what you could do is you could just look at this and take any two, and there's no right two to start with, but you could just say, okay, look, these two intersect. That makes a disk. So, fill in a red disk. Say those two intersect. That fills in a red disk. Then you can imagine all those red disks, the lines in there hit them, and they'd fill in the whole red plane. Okay. Another thing you could do is you could say, you could say, um, Oh my goodness, look at this rotation plus this translation that's perpendicular to it. You could imagine a plane of parallel red lines breaking out. Or you could add this rotation plus that rotation that are parallel and make a plane of parallel red lines with a translation that points perpendicular to that. And that translation could then add to this translation and make a disk. And so, so you can see how you add it all, you, start, you just keep grabbing any two and add to it and then grab any two from what you added uh, or not and just keep grabbing any two until you fill out the space. That's, I found, the, the best way to do it in your head. But maybe that's just me, but I, I think most people have the easiest way of doing that. So, so just some examples. Say I gave you this, you know, four of them. Uh, you add this plus this. It makes a plane of parallel red lines with the translation arrow perpendicular. Add this plus this. Makes another plane going down the other way with the translation that way. You keep adding it. You get a box with a disk of translations, okay? And again, even though I gave you four motions, you could look up and see, well, that contains three. First of all, it's a box. You know it contains three. So you know one of those was dependent, um, you know, and they didn't need to give you the fourth thing. Okay. What about this one? Again, I encourage you to actually put me on pause and try this, okay? Um, 
but let's assume you did that. Okay, so we could take, okay, let's take the translation plus this, this rotation. That gets, um, that's not interesting. That just gets the same thing, but with a bunch of screws up there. And screws aren't usually very helpful, okay? What about this rotation plus that rotation? Well, it gets a big disc. Okay, that's cool. Okay, and then what about, what about that rotation plus that translation? That'll get a plane. Okay, so you can start seeing very quickly you fill this out. Okay? And you can see, even though that's a freedom space we haven't worked with much, that's indeed a freedom space. It's uh, let's see if I can show you, that's this one. Okay, and there's a bunch of screws in there, but it's a plane of parallel red lines and a disc that's, uh, in this case, perpendicular. The freedom space doesn't have to be perpendicular. There can be any angle between those except zero. And the screws will change dramatically based on whether it's 90 degrees or not, but, but that's the constraint space. Okay. Okay, so there you have that. And then uh, what about this one? Three intersecting rotations. This one plus that one's a disk. This one plus that one's a disk. So you see a sphere very quickly. And then the rotate, or sorry, the translation plus this rotation gets a bunch of parallel rotations, which make a bunch of disks that fill out the plane. Or this plus that one gets a bunch of parallel. So hopefully you can see very quickly you get a plane with a, with a sphere. Okay, this, this works great as you, if you memorize that chart and just fill these in. Okay. All right. So so now you can essentially link um, motions you want to uh, freedom spaces. But I do want to give you one other super important tip. Okay. Um, this is very important if you have to find. Uh, you know, all those tips I've given you are really useful for finding kind of simple freedom spaces. But what if they have hyperbolic paraboloids in them? Or what if they have circular hyperboloids or elliptical hyperboloids? Um, well, you've already got the cylindroids down because that, that's part of the, my old chart. But yeah, what, what if you have to do this shape or these shapes, right? And, and this is orthogonal or not? Um, well, there's, there's two things that are super useful to know, OK? And, and they are this. OK, so listen very carefully. So uh, remember. Hyperboloids, whether circular or elliptical, contain three independent things. And hyperbolic paraboloids, whether orthogonal or non-orthogonal, contain three independent things, right? OK. So if I give you three skew lines, so they don't, none of them intersect, and none of them are parallel, OK? So three skew lines, they're all skewed to each other. But they're all on parallel planes, like this. See, that these are all three skew lines. They're all on parallel planes. It will guarantee, if you linearly combine those, make a hyperbolic paraboloid. That is really important to know. And, and it's really tough to like visualize and know that. But you can trust me on that. That's definitely true. And how do you know if it's orthogonal or non-orthogonal hyperbolic? Well, if you, since they're all on three parallel planes, and they're all skew and everything, um, there's going to be a shortest distance line uh, between between all the planes, right? Um, and if that shortest distance line intersects all three, which it's not showing here, it intersects these two. You know, I, I could here's the shortest distance line between those two, and it looks like for these two there would be a different shortest distance line, and between those two there would be a different shortest distance line. If if this doesn't lie on that as it's showing here, this would be a non-orthogonal um, uh, hyperbolic paraboloid. But if this guy, if that point does lie on here, in other words, if, if I move that red line onto there and point it in any direction as long as it's still skew from the other two, then it would be an orthogonal hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay, so let me restate that. If you ever have three rotations or three anything, they could be constraint lines or rotations or screw, you know, any anything, okay, of the same pitch, let's say that, or Q, um, Right, so if they're all zero or they're all pitch of one or they're all you know um, anything with a, the same pitch, okay, and they are skew with respect to each other, so none of them are parallel or intersecting, and then they all lie on parallel planes, then they will make a hyperbolic paraboloid of those twists with that pitch, with all the same pitch. Okay, if they're if they're all rotations, then they'll all be red with zero pitch. If they're all screws of one, they'll all be green screws of one. Okay, 
It will be non-orthogonal if one of the lines doesn't lie, if they don't all share a common shortest distance line, then it will be non-orthogonal. If they do share a common um, uh, you know, shortest distance line, then it will be orthogonal. Okay? If they don't, it's non-orthogonal, vice versa. Okay? All right. So the other super important point is, say again, we have three rotations or three screws of the same pitch, okay, um, right? And they are also all skew, meaning they also don't intersect or are parallel ever, but they don't lie on parallel planes. So in other words, for any two you could pick, you could draw parallel planes and, and define a shortest distance line. So I, I picked these two, drew the planes, and that's the shortest distance line between those two. Well, then the third is not going to be on a parallel plane. It's going to guaranteed pierce it, okay? And I, again, I could, have, I could have chosen these two and drawn their planes for the shortest distance line, then this would have pierced it. It, it really doesn't matter. But if you have three uh, rotations or three screws of the same pitch, and they are all skew, they don't intersect or parallel anywhere, and they don't all lie on parallel lines, then they will guaranteed make either a circular or an elliptical hyperboloid. And as of now, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know a trick to distinguish, you know, characteristics about this to know whether it will be circular or elliptical. Okay? So if anyone knows that trick, uh, let me know. <laughs> okay? Because um, that, that would be useful for, for certain scenarios, uh, rare scenarios. But, but I, I do know for sure that this will always make one or the other. Okay? So that's very useful if you're ever dealing with hyperboloids or, or circular, you know, elliptical or circular hyperboloids. Or <laughs> parabolic. Anyway, these things. Okay, it's, it's been a long day here. All right. All right, so, so that's, that's it. Um, what I was going to do is practice a bunch of these, but what we can do is in office hours, um, uh, I can, uh, and, and for exam reviews and stuff, we can uh, do a bunch of practice problems. Um, uh, you know, um, you know, th through that. So, so I, I don't have slides uh, prepared on that, but um, but that's what we would uh, normally do in class, and that's what we can do in office hours. So, with that, that concludes um, uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, thanks again for listening. Tune in for the next one.